Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I am so excited that you are all here. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, please be sure to share. Um, we are really excited about this conversation. I am Allison Jones, Vice President of Community Mobilization here at the National Black Child Development Institute. For over 50 years, NBCDI has been the only organization of its kind supremely focused on Black children pre-birth to age eight in their families. Our founders saw the infinite possibilities for Black children when essentially the world did not. The work of NBCDI is to dismantle and neutralize the racial and systemic disparities that stand in the way of our eight future outcomes. Our virtual learning series is designed to lift up research, information, and discussion that move us forward as a collective in learning and growth towards a future where Black children are valued, healthy, joyful, and thriving. Join us bi-monthly as we connect and learn together. Our next virtual event will be May 25th. Be sure to follow us on social media and visit us at nbcdi.org to stay connected. Welcome again, everyone. And I will now turn things over to NBCDI's president and CEO, Dr. Leah Austin, and our esteemed guest, Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families, January Contreras. Be sure to connect, share, and enjoy. Thanks, everyone. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you, Allison, for that wonderful and warm introduction. Um, I have to share with you all, I can see that we're almost at 200 participants so that just makes me so happy um, to see how many people are interested in this conversation. I know that I personally am just thrilled to be able to sit down and have this time with you, Assistant Secretary. It is just, um, you know, I know you have a very busy schedule, so it's very gracious of you to uh, commit this amount of time to us. And so just want to start off just thanking you and also just share just how I am so excited for the conversation and to really have a conversation to get to know you as a person, um, to talk about your very important role as the Assistant Secretary for the Administration for Children and Families, mm -hmm. and to learn more about the priorities of the department and ways that we can be helpful, right? Because we know that partnership and partners and relationships are always so important to getting any work that we need to get done completed. And so really wanna spend some time thinking together and talking out loud about how we can uh, better par partner. So welcome. Um, and you know, we never, it feels like we just never have enough time. So I wanna like jump right on in and start with a question that I hope will surface and act as a bit of an introduction. Um, so we are, you know, it's March 30th, hard to believe that we are at the end of March. Uh, which is also Women's History Month. And so wanted to just ask you if you would take a few minutes to tell more of your story um, and share with us a bit about your journey, um, pro professionally, personally, to becoming the Assistant Secretary of the Administration for Children and Families, and perhaps how that journey has shaped you as a leader. Thank you, Dr. Austin. And first, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, and to the National Black Child Development Institute for all that you do. Um, you know, we know that your focus on, you know, supporting the success of Black children and families isn't only important for one part of our country, it's important for the whole country. Uh, so very, very grateful for what you do and glad to be here with you today. Um, so in talking about my journey, and it varies, I agree, it's hard to believe it's the last, you know, we're getting to the end of March. Um, but I had so much fun this Women's History Month. I, I just left a convening of women faith leaders uh, here at HHS. And I told them, you know, I think that was the most powerful room in the building. And I am feeling a little bit of that spirit with me. So that's uh, bringing that into this space. Um, you know, I'm from Arizona. I saw in the chat at least a couple people from Arizona. So shout out to all my Arizonan um, friends. And I grew up, you know, my my dad was in the Air Force. 
my name, you know, so I was supposed to be named Christina Maria. My parents met in high school. They dated in high school. They married right after they, uh, you know, he joined the Air Force. She went with him to Texas. They got married. And, um, you know, when she had me, she said she felt so lonely that she just broke the deal of what my name was to be. She named me January Joy because I was her child. Um you know, she became a single mom at the age of five. And, and, you know, I've been very lucky to have my dad's presence in my life, but raised by a single mom who um, both of them went to work at the post office after that. And they worked that second shift. Um, so that meant when I got home from school, they weren't there. And um, so I stayed with my grandparents. Like, you know, she was a single mom by the time I was five. And um, I stayed with my grandparents you know, one of those lucky kids who has the support system there built in. Uh, my mom was one of 11 kids. So I was often more like the youngest child than the oldest grandchild. Um, and, you know, my grandparents, my nana and tata, they were just huge, huge rocks in my life. Um, and, you know, when our parents are young, sometimes you're, you know, you're growing up alongside of them. But I had this opportunity to watch my mom while she worked the second shift. Uh, you know, I'd call her, I'd have her page to say goodnight um, and watch her earn her college degree. She's a very determined woman. Uh, she's from a, a largely Latino high school, uh, working class neighborhood. When she told them at her high school, she thought she wanted to go to college. They just didn't know what to do with that. And, you know, told her that that wasn't, you know, for her, gave her some other options about what, what she could really achieve, but she did it. Um, and so, you know, that's a big part of my journey. I think we then had some years that were, you know, many of us know what it's like to have a little bit of chaos in your life as a kid. Um, we had some of those years and I feel like they, they shaped me so much in terms of knowing what, how community can make such a difference to help young people through those difficult moments. Um, being a caregiver for my sister. So my sister's 11 years younger than me. My mom still worked nights then. So, um, you know, I had that responsibility. Thank goodness I did, or I probably would have been getting myself into trouble, but I had to take care of my sister. Uh, and I really think that shaped me. I often tell folks when I'm talking to them, you know, you don't have to be the student body president to be a leader. Um, and so often for us, leadership starts at the home. And that was really my first leadership journey was taking care of my sister, being responsible for a little human being um, and helping my family navigate uh, through those tough years. So I emerged, I really felt an obligation, a very deep obligation to help people who also go through difficult times and help them get through the other side. Um, and then had a career that just allowed me to do that. I did go to law school. Um, I worked in Medicaid and I worked in public health, leading the public health department of Arizona. Um, worked a lot in, in violence against women and family violence and trying to make it better for immigrant survivors of violence so that they're not afraid to call the police. Um, they're not consequences for calling the police for help um, and got to see some really good stuff happen. And then um, I started a legal aid organization. And so for the last eight years prior to this position, I ran a legal aid position and um, our age cutoff was 24. So we really focused on the 18 to 24 year olds. Almost all of them were in the runaway and homeless youth program or in the foster care young adult program or in a domestic violence shelter or in a program for human trafficking survivors. Um, and it just, it just um, changed my view of the world, helped me understand the struggles that um, so many young people go through. And um, that's just what I felt as my calling. And I've just been so lucky to be able to answer it and have amazing opportunities in front of me. So in some way, I just wanna say, it's pretty insane that I'm the assistant secretary for the administration for children and families because I'm just a normal kid um, who cared 
which I know is what you have on this call, you know, a bunch of people who care. Um, and then, and somehow, you know, that um, journey, that professional journey of being true to what I believed in, of, of believing in the power of people and, and that I could make a difference in it, um, you know, led me here. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve in this way. I have amazing colleagues within ACF, whether that's, you know, uh, our commissioner, uh, Gaston Jones or Associate Commissioner Schomburg, you know, we have Deputy Assistant Secretary Johnson with us today, you know, Ann Flagg, you know, you name it, I, I can't name because I will, I will not be able to name them all. Um, you know, in the, in the early care space, we have Katie Ham and Ruth Friedman and now Corey Garvin, who's just joined as the national leader for Head Start. So very exciting um, to work with this team of people who are just completely committed to what they do. Um, and, and in terms of my personal journey, I really just, I credit my family for being there for me. I credit my little sister for making me have to be a, a responsible grown up before having any idea that that would probably be the most impactful uh, part of my life because it shaped the rest of it. Um, and I'm just, you know, very grateful for all the partners that we have to work for. And, you know, I, now I'm, I'm watching, I don't wear a watch, but I'm constantly watching it because we have this time in the Biden-Harris administration and we want to get done as much as we can. And we want to leave a legacy and we want to prioritize kids and families. And I'm proud of the work we've been able to do and really excited about what else we're going to get done on our watch. So again, thanks so much for allowing me to share that. I, I appreciate it. Anytime I can lift up my DNA, uh, my family, uh, uh, I, I, and I hope that allows all of us to think about our own, our own journeys and our own families, because, you know, there's nothing special about mine. I've been very, very blessed in the opportunities that I've had to serve. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I, I agree with you. I, I, I personally, um, and profession. I just, I love to hear how people have gotten to the role they're in um, because it's, it's very telling and it really helps you understand what an individual is bringing because they're never, you're never just bringing your formal education. You are bringing this context, this community, this history, a full holistic experience. And so just really appreciate you um, being willing and taking the time to share your story. There are a number of points you made that resonated for me just personally. So I'll just quickly say, I too had a counselor who, <laughs> when I expressed interest in going to college said, why? And I was like, what do you mean why? <laughs> I think that's what I'm supposed to do. And, and that counselor was just not encouraging at all, was very discouraging of my uh, choosing a the, the college track, and I say track intentionally. Um, so that resonated because absolutely had that experience and the taking care of a younger sister. So I'm from a family of four and I'm, you know, when you're four, there's not really a middle, but I'm in the middle of that four. And so I have a younger sister and we joke that I think I raised her um, and I did, <laughs> I really did. So that also resonated as the importance of Having that responsibility at a young age definitely um, meant there was a different kind of seriousness that I had to step into as a very young person. And then um, lastly, when you talked about, and I love that you said, you know, you don't have to be the student council president to be a leader, because I can just say I absolutely was not that. I was not a great high school student. But I, I was able to demonstrate leadership and be a leader in so many different ways. So just really appreciate um, hearing your journey and then being able to reflect on mine and make the you know these beautiful connections with each other. Um, I, then, go ahead. No, absolutely. I was just going to say I love that, and it makes me want to give a shout out to my counselor because even though my grades were not great, she wrote this. She's the one who told me you know I was going to head to community college, and she said you need to go to university. She wrote these letters about, because I was not qualified for the university. You know, we really did have a lot going on in our home. I was not focused on school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she wrote this 
letter calling me a late bloomer and about how she knew that I could succeed. Now she was a Latina as well. She was Mexican American. And I think that speaks to the need for diversity in all of our spaces and where we see potential and hope. And so I, I just wanted to lift her up, but I appreciate you sharing your story. Cause I think there's not, there is no typical journey. Um, you know, we, we, I, I love hearing that about you. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And appreciate the shout out because it does speak to the need for diversity and the need for advocates and allies and mentors and role models at every aspect um, of our life. So you mentioned at the end of, uh, not the end of your journey, but the end of the description of the journey, um, not wearing a watch and I don't wear a watch either. So that, <laughs> you know, time is but a construct. So I'm, I'm with you there. Um, but I really appreciated that you were sort of aligning that to the urgency you feel feel in your, your role and kind of the time boundary that you are working within. And so wondered if you might talk a little bit about the priorities of the department and what you all are hoping to accomplish uh, during your term, during the time that you, you know you do have. Yeah, absolutely, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, there, there, there's, there's a couple of overarching strategic plan goals that this team at ACF put in place before I got there, but that are very important to driving our work in this administration. So, and, and that is centered around equity. Like, what are we doing to really center equity in our work? What are we doing to change who's at the table to influence the way policies are developed, to influence the way that we are implementing them? How are we bringing more voices with lived experience to the table early and consistently into our process? How are we working to make sure that services are not delivered in a different way based on zip codes? Um, you know, how, how are we doing these things and we're challenging ourselves in these ways? So equity is one, prevention is another very central theme. How can we move services upstream? Um, you know, what can we do to recognize that um, prevention can help people avoid crisis? Um, and then third around a whole family approach. So we, you can't connect kids from their parents. Um, there are many caregivers who are not the parents, but they're a part of that family. So those three overarching things are a very important part. And the specific priorities that we're really driving towards are around child and family safety and well-being. And we're looking at that everything from, you know, we just put out in uh, national proposed rulemaking uh, last month around kinship caregivers, for example. We want to leave this administration with it clear for states um, that kinship is the preferred, if a kid cannot be with their parents and has to be at a home, then kinship is the preferred placement. And we want them to have access to the same financial support. We want them to have less uh, burdens without sacrificing safety for them to be able to fill those roles. Um, you know, it's everything from our family violence work. So you'll see um, with the support of Congress, so much funding being put into uh, now culturally specific service providers. So we are, are putting grants into place um, for service providers that especially know they're staffed by, they're led by, and they're serving you know, their particular community, whatever that may be. Um, you know, these are some of the kinds of things that, that we're able to you know, be moving on in this space. Um, we have a very heavy focus on early education and care, child care, as you know, and I think we're going to talk more about that today. Um, but again, recognizing, you know, it, the pandemic showed us so much. Um, it exposed so much. One of the things we saw was this country cannot function without a solid and secure um, child care and early learning structure. And, um, you know, everything from the wages of our child care workforce, uh, are, it's, it's clear that we need to work on it, to making sure that parents have more access to affordable options. So that's another big priority for us. Mental health and workforce are two more priorities. 
I will say it doesn't matter where I go and which part of ACF's community I'm speaking with, mental health among you know who they're serving constantly. People are in, in need of solutions and access to supports and services and workforce. Um, you know, again, any part of our, the human services sector, they're not finding the staff they need. They're not finding the experienced staff. And they, when they hire staff, they're not staying. Um, and so we have a lot of focus on how are we supporting and bringing sort of best practices forward in those spaces. Um, we took on a very specific obligation for our nation to nation commitment. So we've elevated that to be a priority for us. Um, <clears throat> and also a very heavy focus <clears throat> on youth. Um, and you know, really that 18 to 24 year old space, we don't want them to get lost. Um, we know that they need supports. That's a critical time in their life about you know, what trajectory they're, they're able to um, take. And so you know, those are some of the priorities that we're very focused on. Thank you. No, very helpful. And there are just a number of priorities that you've named that, well, actually all of the priorities you named resonate with me, resonate with the organization, you know, National Black Child Development Institute. And I see lots of hearts <laughs> in the chat. So I can tell that they are resonating um, very much so with the audience. So thank you for sharing those. Um, just thinking about the you know, it's it's March, we're in the new year, the fiscal, uh, the, the budget has come out. Are there specific aspects of uh, the Biden administration's budget um, that really align with, bolster, support the priorities that you've laid out? And if so, could you just sort of talk about some of those uh, very specific um, alignments between the budget and your priorities? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Austin. I mean, that, uh... That's always, I always say, you know, if you want to see someone's values in government, you look at the budget and you look at the calendar. Um, and so I appreciate that question. You'll see, one thing you'll see that's front and center is this very unprecedented uh, proposal by President Biden in this White House around childcare. Uh, you know, a $600 billion proposal over 10 years to really create a childcare infrastructure that, um, it, that families can access without copays. That you know, you know, with a, a an aim towards a universal preschool for four year olds. I mean, it's a big proposal. Um, also, very key investments in Head Start, um, with acknowledging that we need to raise those wages because we do have, um, you know, some Head Start programs who aren't able to open a classroom that they normally would because they aren't attracting or being able to retain the staff that they need. And we recognize, you know, coming out of the pandemic, uh, and we're not, and I'm not saying that's over, we are still dealing with it. Um, but the worst sort of that those early years were, um, you know, it just changed the norms for us. Um, Many sectors, if you just look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, many sectors have started to bounce back. Our child care workforce has not. Um, and wages is a big part of that. And I, I can see some of the chat comments popping up and I, I appreciate that validation. We know that there's so many Head Start programs and child care providers who, you know, the, the ARP monies, the American Rescue Plan that came out under President Biden and, you know, uh, the Congress were so important, um, but also Head Start and child care providers are, are saying, you know, okay, and what's next? And what are the sustainable investments? Because we need to have a full and a fully trained and a qualified staff so that we can continue to, you know, meet a gold standard for the kids and families we serve. So we're doing a lot of listening and we hear that message over and over. And I'm just, I'm very proud that when we hear um, that kind of feedback from community, the people with the lived experience, those who know, we share it up. You know, Secretary Vesetta listens. 
and the White House, President Biden, Vice President Harris. I mean, you have, you really do have a chain of communication that goes up. And this issue of child care, Head Start, early learning, early care, it's just, a, there's no question, it's a big priority for Secretary Wasetta and is a, a huge priority for President Biden. Thank you. And you did um, a really great job of kind of summarizing um, not just the priorities, but the, and the major issues that seem to continue um, to sort of rear their heads when we think about early childhood development and learning, the, the field of early childhood and the systems of early childhood. So as we know, the systems are very fragmented and often disconnected. Um, while we know that the needs of the families tend to boil down to, and you, you name these like kind of four things, it's like access to programs, access to care. And, it, and I really appreciate you lifting up kinship care um, we're doing a lot of work around kinship care and family friend and neighbor care and just the importance of not just respecting that choice and that option for families, but also um, understanding the importance of those providers and the value of those providers from an income and resource standpoint. So really appreciate you naming that. Um, and then it's also about programs being high quality, right? But, and high quality really looking and unpacking, unpacking the definition of quality, right? And making sure that diversity and cultural relevancy is a part of that definition um, when, we, when we think about it. Um, and then the workforce and ensuring that we have a workforce that is paid well, um, so that they can live and raise their families and take care of themselves, as well as thinking about how do we increase the professional development of the fields and of individuals without erasing people, without um, not valuing the lived experience that we provide. It doesn't have to be a competition or binary between your lived experience and your formal education, we started off the hour talking about both of our journeys and how those two, those two things are always connected. There is no disconnection between those. Um, and then lastly, the alignment between early childhood and other family supporting policies. And so just wonder, as you're thinking about your priorities, you're thinking about the infrastructure needed around child care, you're thinking about the investments in Head Start and specifically, you know, around raising wages. Um, what is the work, what is the work that continues to uh, need to be done to, I don't want to use the word fix, fix is, uh, is just not a, a great word, but to, to do a better job of actually having a more effective, a more connected and aligned early childhood system. And then are there places, you know, as you are clearly all around the country, are there places to point to as really kind of bright spots that are getting it right or really making strides that we should learn from? I think that, it, you know, yeah, I appreciate those questions. So I'll, I'll just give one example of, um, you know, as you say, not a fix, but how do we keep evolving? How do we keep you know, taking actions that make sure that, you know, we are doing everything we can to provide access to families and to, to quality care and learning. So one of the things that the administration did, um, and I'm, I'm really proud of how both within HHS, within ACF, but even through the federal government, you do see more of the, you know, moments where the silos come down and there's collaboration. And so earlier last year, um, we, we announced a new streamlined eligibility for Head Start with SNAP, right? So recognizing, you know, I, I know through legal aid, most of who I serve were young moms. You know, they had two jobs, they were just trying to make it. Um, so anything we can do to make it, a gateway, right? If they're entering one program, they're entering a gateway to all of the resources that we have at ACF, at HHS, at our, our partners around USDA, HUD. 
Um, and really proud of that, that work because it's something that the communities have been telling us, why can't, why does someone have to do this? Give the same information, they're the same people, they're eligible. Um, and we made it happen. And I think that's the kind of sort of smart government that, that should be happening more often. It's reducing burden on parents, it's reducing um, the amount of red tapes red tape that needs to be followed. So that's an example I'm proud of on our side. As I have traveled and I've met both with Head Start program leaders and I've met with childcare leaders, um, I appreciate that you raised, you know, the um, promoting and supporting the child uh, workforce professional development. One thing I saw when I was in Louisiana was, you know, for out of, each classroom, you know, this is a place that sort of was beating the odds in terms of retention. Their staff was staying. And so, you know, I was asking them more. They were known for it. That's one reason that, um, that this was the place suggested for me to go to. It was a combination of state dollars. So, you know, some of them being monies that came through the American Rescue Plan or other, you know, um, we had so much federal funding coming through the, those early years of COVID. And that state of Louisiana, they really put them to use um, in innovative ways that, that made a difference. So uh, it was very sort of, you know, encouraging to see. Um, they felt supported both by federal partners and by state partners, and it made a difference for them. Now, were they still nervous about what comes next when this funding runs out? Yes. They're talking to philanthropic organizations or talking to others about how to keep some of the programs going. But a lot of their focus was on the development of their own staff. And so when you walked through this child care center outside the classrooms, you could see these certificates, right? Someone was certified as a coach. Someone was certified in evaluation. I mean, there was just a lot of pride in the um, you know, the, the sort of extra accreditation and training that um, the teachers in this center had. And there it was right on the door. So you could, so parents could see it, so they could know, you know, this is a, a place where teachers stayed, where they were advancing themselves. It, to me, it really stuck in my mind because, um, because A, their retention was higher than most. And then you see some of those signs of, okay, because they said it wasn't all wages, that their wages were a little better, but not, you know, not entirely different. But they felt like they, in their center, were able to show that this is a profession, that in the child care space, there's pride in that, that there are opportunities to continue to grow, that there are opportunities to be mentors to young, uh, or I should say earlier in their career, um, child care workers, well, no matter what their age is. Um, and, and I could see that. And it was very, so to me, that made a difference. I'm always out there just trying to see, you know, what does work? What does make a difference? And, you know, our, again, the working with the ACF leadership team, um, you know, they, they help make sure I get out to places where I can see that. And I appreciate it. Um. That's an awesome example. And it and I really appreciate, I just could see the certificates and as you were telling the story, could really feel um, one, how it touched you and can could feel the energy of this pride and really wanting to um, brag and show what you know the the um, educators there were doing. Um, and it just makes it's an interesting point that makes me think about often when we talk about. Uh, professionalization of the field, it's not it, it can sometimes feel, and I say this word kind of loosely, but intentionally like a punishment or, you know, focused on sort of accountability. And what you're lifting up is that there's a, there's a reality that we need to understand that the, by and large, the individuals who come into this field are coming into this field as professionals, they are educators, and there is a pride in being an early childhood educator. And so professional development opportunities 
especially when framed that way, um, that they are able to have access to and able to improve and build their skills and strengthen who they are as a professional doesn't have to feel like, you know, a charge that you have to do. It can feel more of feeding into your soul and feeding the pride that you have already when you step into this field. So I just really appreciate the way you told that story and using that language of pride in the profession. Um, because I think that that's, it, it, it's so clear to me that educators in this field are in this field because they want to be, they are professionals and they want to be valued and respected as professionals that are educating, not just taking care of, which is also important, but educating our, our, youngest, um, our youngest people, our children. You also mentioned in that example, um, how in Louisiana they were using um, the, their, their funding in some innovative ways. And you started to name some stakeholders. So philanthropy, and so I want to ask a question that sort of gets to stakeholders and partnerships. And how do organizations, I'll start with this one, and then after I'll, I'll ask about more specific stakeholders, but how do, how do advocacy organizations, at organizations like the National Black Child Development Institute, how should we work with the administration, partner with the administration, to create this more unified system and to really help you all to accomplish the priorities, the goals that you set out to accomplish? Well, I mean, I think what you do is so often gonna be aligned with what we do, at least in this administration. Um, we have, you know, again, a, the, the Biden-Harris administration very focused on families and kids and how do you give them more breathing room uh, is what we hear President Biden speak to. And um, so there's just going to be a lot of natural alignment. But I think, you know, lifting up um, what are your your member stories around child care? You know, it, has there been any attention to it in your local community in the media? Do you have employers uh, when I was out in Denver, it was very, um, I, I appreciated meeting with employers in Denver. They want, they, they're, these are employers who created their own coalition, who are stepping up to say, hey, look, we can't attract the workforce we need if we don't have, uh, you know, quality and affordable childcare available. And so you saw different models that they were putting into place there. Um, I mean, I think partially the, the, importance of um, our partnerships are you have different constituencies than we do. You have membership all across the country. You have membership of who, you know, looks different and talks different and, uh, you know, worships differently or not at all and, you know, lives in rural and urban areas and suburbs and, um, you know, all those things are important to, to share the stories of the issues that we work on, whether that's you know, child care or Head Start or kinship caregiving, you know, as an example. Um, and that, you know, partnership in terms of, you know, it, so much of what we do, we have, we have partnerships with states, with tribes, with territories, sometimes with local governments. Um, and you have more influence in terms of how, if we're prioritizing kinship caregiving, we certainly, you know, we're changing a rule, we're, putting out guidance, we create new funding, but also it's the real people on the ground, you know, the grandparents on the ground, the, the childcare workforce, all the nonprofits out there that serve youth and, and know how vital those relationships are and um, how important for equity it is that kinship caregivers can get the, get the kind of support that a, that a foster parent would get. Um, so I think part of that is done at the local level. And I think at ours, it's it's staying in touch. It's, you know, you offering to hold a round table with, you know, 12 other organizations who you know share your priorities. And maybe you have recommendations for us, or maybe you see we're working on issue A, B, or C, and that's what you want to focus on in that. You know, we are working really hard to 
make government be for the people, by the people. That's how government was designed. And so I think our partnerships and, you know, the voices of those who are part of your membership, who are part of your network, your voice, um, you know, it's important. You may have access to data that we don't have or, or we haven't focused on it. Um, you know, you may have access or, or visibility to certain uh, programs that, you know, we can be highlighting or we can be learning from. So it's definitely a two-way um, relationship. And we want you to hold us accountable, too. I'll, I, I want to say that out loud. You know, we have goals. Um, this Biden-Harris administration has very ambitious goals. I'm incredibly proud of the team that I work with and how much um, advancement we're really making. And we need to be told, you know, keep doing more, um, you know. So I think that's that's helpful for us to, you know, make sure that we're constantly hearing from important stakeholders like you. Absolutely. Um, and accountability is not a bad word. <laughs> it gets a bad rap, but it's not a bad word. I mean, it is definitely, um, it, it's just another part of partnership is, you know, setting the stage for what do we want to do and then holding each other accountable for, are we doing it? Are we on our way there? Are we being authentic in what we said we want to accomplish? So appreciate you um, just saying out loud, you know, hold the administration accountable because that is a large part of the work of it's um, specifically advocacy based organizations is it is holding government accountable so appreciate that I wonder if you have you know we've, we've talked a bit about advocacy organizations um, and that sort of that that partnership can that can happen I wonder if and it may be the same but if there's anything you would say um, around the support of philanthropy and how the philanthropic space and our philanthropic friends can also be um, in partnership and supportive of the goals you all are trying to accomplish. Um, I do think it's also a, a two-way relationship. Um, we have philanthropic partners in our spaces, right? In a, especially in child welfare and in early care and early learning. There are, um, funders out there on the national level, on a local level, family foundations, who really are um, have a long legacy of supporting best practices, of trying to move you know, towards prevention before it was in the ACF strategic plan. Um, and also, you know, we want to share our priorities so that you know, we hope when we're talking about youth between 18 and 24 and they need more support, you know, it is my hope that funders hear that and they look at their own portfolio um, and yes, keep investing in kids that are, you know, our little ones, um, but also don't forget those 18 to 24 year olds because their challenges are different and their challenges are at a time in their life where they may see no options in front of them and support can put an option A or B in front of them. It's a time, um, I mean, just from my legal aid experience, I just watch these young people come in with their heads low and just, they ran out of hope. They ran out of trusting adults. They ran out of patience. They, you know, people didn't come through for them. Systems seem to work against them sometimes instead of for them. Um, and the more we can build community to create options, to create supports, you know, those are opportunities to build hope in that generation who, you know, it, it makes all the difference. It's a very magic ingredient if a young person feels hopeful about what's ahead. So, um, you know, I, that's when I think of philanthropy, I think of, I wanna learn from them. Sometimes they're, they have good data, Sometimes they have good recommendations. Sometimes they have the ear of Congress in a way that others of us don't. You know, if you look at the Family First Prevention Services Act, as an example, a landmark piece of legislation passed in 2018, bipartisan support, truly designed to unlock 
mental health services, um, parent training, and substance use treatment. It's big. There's a lot of funding there. Um, you know, I think the the funder community, the philanthropic community, was a big part of getting that by part the bipartisan dialogue. Um, and it's a great reminder about how these issues we work on for kids, uh, they can be bipartisan. Um, and it's important for us to have very diverse voices at the table because they can bring in different members of, you know, different um, segments of policymakers, different like regions of the country, you know. Um, so I, that's what I think of when I think, I think they're a very important part and probably Family First is a just a very good example about, you know, what can happen when they choose to really be engaged in a committed way. That That's a great example. Um, and what you lifted up for me in both your response to the question about philanthropy and also about advocacy and community-based organizations is that, I, I wrote it down and circled, influence, that we have a level of influence that we may not always realize we actually have. And so what I hear you saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that leaning into that influence we have, whether it's, you know, from telling stories and really lifting up the stories of our affiliate network and our membership, um, whether it's, you know, financial influence, there's, there's something really there for us to think about so that we're not, because it can often feel like, oh, well, there's just, there's so many issues and the government can feel very distant from where you are in your community, very focused on your, your work, right? And so, but what I hear you and in the invitation I'm receiving at least <laughs> is this invitation to really lift up and lean into the influence that we do have because there's expertise, there's information, there's experience that we have that we can really put forward and just really lean into this influence strategy. So that's, um, that, that, that's really interesting. And I wonder kind of uh, attached to that um, and as we're wrapping up the conversation, if there's anything else you kind of wish people knew or understood about ACF? Huh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> um, you know, I think it, uh, it just comes back to me about the people at ACF. Um, you know, every year there's a federal survey of every agency and the divisions within it. Um, and of course, you know, our team, participated in that in a, in a big way. And the number one finding that came out of that is the number one reason or factor that makes ACF employees satisfied with their job is meaningful work. And again, I know everybody on this call, everybody on this gathering today is probably moved by the same, but it just... Uh, reinforced for me, you know, why I'm here, why they're here. And it doesn't matter if they're the program director of our family violence work, or they're a grants manager for our, you know, TANF program, or they're a, you know, a field specialist for our unaccompanied children program. I mean, wherever they sit, they're, they believe in our mission at ACF. Um, and I just take away so much pride uh, with that because um, they're there because they want to be. You know, we really are a very unique part of government, I believe. I mean, I, you know, props to my sister agencies all over. I, I know people believe in their mission, but I think we're one of the only ones when we have all staff meetings, we have these emojis floating up, you know, during our all staff meetings as well. Um, and so I think it's just, they're, they're a, a great committed team. We have to keep supporting them, obviously pandemic hard on all of us. Um, 
the workforce challenges that our grantees and that our partners feel, it weighs on our, our team too. Um, you know, we want, I think a lot of us go to bed, you know, with some of the worries on our mind. It's not a job that you leave uh, eight to five necessarily, uh, but we wake up sort of, I think, motivated about, okay, what is it we're gonna do today? Um, and just to say, we are trying very hard to create more collaboration among our programs. Uh, we really are. And so it's not perfect. We definitely have a ways to go, but the intentionality is there. And I see it um, more and more often that, you know, we're thinking together around how do we support those that we serve all around the country. Absolutely. Thank you. And I've, I've met um, a few of your team members and will say that everything you just said rings true. The conversations that I know we've had and our teams have had have been just really inspiring and um, the the alignment, the mission and purpose driven um, nature resonates because I definitely have heard, I've experienced it in dealing and working with your team. So really love to hear that. Um, and I'm also thinking about our audience and folks who have joined today who um, quite a few are educators and they are advocates. Um, and so I just wonder as we close out, if there's any kind of parting word or words uh, that you might share with the audience as they are in the trenches and doing the really, really hard work on a daily basis, just any, any kind of parting words you might provide them. Yeah, well, before I give my thanks, I'll, I will mention on our med, with our Medicaid and CHIP programs that that public health emergency is ending. So no matter where you are in our systems, if you're serving our families who may be on Medicaid or, or children's health insurance programs, CMS has some amazing materials available on the Unwinding um, website. So we'd love for you to incorporate some of that in what you're doing just to ask families have they updated their address we um, have the potential for millions of people to lose their coverage and we're trying to work all hands on deck to address that um, and then finally I'll just say thank you thank you I think the human services sector is a very special community of people for all the social workers out there happy social workers month um, and, you know, for all of us, I just, I thank you for answering the calling that you felt, and, you know, Dr. Austin, for you too. I mean, you know, something in this group of people um, doesn't allow us to look away. That's not our problem, right? We want to look right at it, where we see need or where we see opportunity to build young people and families. We look towards it. We walk towards it. So I, I really think... Um, our human services community, all of our partners um, throughout our ACF programs, you know, for answering that calling. Um, and, you know, give yourselves a hug because, and then maybe you won't get enough <laughs> today or a week from now. Um, and it can be very hard work. Uh, you know, please take a moment for yourself, um, but, you know, acknowledge the work that you do and the difference that it makes for families and kids and individuals in need across the country. So. Thank you again. It's really, you know, we're privileged to work with you. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, you know, ending with the answer to the calling is just like a perfect ending to this conversation because I know we are all here because we have answered our call and this is definitely the, the kind of work that we're in. I am, um, again, so appreciative of your time your expertise um, and just, you know, everything that you brought to this conversation and that you're bringing to the administration. And I wanna thank our audience for joining us. We have 203 participants who stayed on with us and are putting hearts and hand claps and questions in the chat. And so really appreciate that. Any questions that we did not get a chance to verbally respond to, because I know we had moderators in the chat uh, responding, we will respond to you. So really appreciate your time um, joining this conversation today. And then want to invite you all to be in partnership with the National Black Child Development Institute. You can visit our website at nbcdi.org. 
You can also follow us on all social media at NBCDI. I'm just really thankful for everyone. Time is a precious commodity and the fact that you have spent this hour with us is so meaningful and means everything to all of us. So thank you all and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.